Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln, which is in the United Kingdom. And in this video, I wanted to explain what hypernova are and how they're different to supernovas, kilonovas and novas, essentially. So what makes these different to all the other sorts of explosions that we actually get in the universe? Before we do that, let's just have a quick recap of supernovas. If you haven't had a look at these before, so the most common types that we have of supernovas, at least, are the type 1A, any type 2, and they are basically created by different things. And you see slightly different things and different things are essentially left over from them as well. So a type 1A is thermonuclear. This means that you basically have a white dwarf star, a red giant star. When the red giant star swells up, it pulls or some material is pulled off it onto the white dwarf. Now, the white dwarf can only grow to a certain size before it gets too hot because the gravitational forces will be trying to collapse it because there's nothing actually holding it out on the other way, essentially. There's no outward pressure that you would normally get in a star. You do have electron degeneracy, but you can essentially overcome that. Now, once that is occurring, it's starting to heat up. Once it gets to the ignition temperature of about carbon, then the entire white dwarf star goes into a thermonuclear explosion, which is your type. 1a. Now a type 1a doesn't typically leave anything behind so the white dwarf star is completely destroyed it's not it doesn't survive. The red giant star would survive but it may have its outer layers stripped from the supernova and it would give or be given a velocity kick so it's kind of thrown out into space from where it was so it will lose its outer layers and then it's moving much faster. Essentially. Now a type 2 is from a death of a massive star so it's the core collapse this is not thermonuclear this is when the actual central core of the star stops generating energy so there's no outward pressure anymore and it collapses due to gravity now what happens then is that it overshoots your neutron degeneracy pressure <clears throat> and you get a rebound from that and that rebounding shock wave goes through the outer layers it accelerates them and you get your typical supernova essentially and they will leave behind a stellar remnant so at the center of that you will get a neutron star a black hole actually this is an image of a, of a pulsar which is essentially a, a neutron star it's a very very dense object left in the center not like the type 1a so you do get something left behind from the death of a massive star with a type 2. Now a kilonova is something come different entirely it's not from the death of a massive star and it's not from one star pulling material off another one. This is from the in spiral and collision of two neutron stars, or possibly even a neutron star and a black hole. And when they collide, you then get your kilonova, and they are not really as bright as a supernova, but they are still brighter than a nova. And a nova can be like a reoccurrent eruption from a star, a very significant one, something like that, and it will happen over and over again. But a supernova happens once, same as a kilonova. And a kilonova, brightness wise, the kind of energy it's really emitting it sits in between the two, essentially, between one tenth and one hundredth the brightness of a supernova. Now, supernova are very high energy. They're some of the most energetic events we have in the universe, and they can outshine whole galaxies. So, here you've got a supernova occurring in a spiral galaxy on the outer parts, and luminosity wise, it can appear brighter than the actual galaxy itself. Bearing in mind the size difference is huge. This is a very small object compared to something that's hundreds of billions of times more massive. Now, a hypernova is typically quite unusual because it has very high kinetic energy, which a supernova typically wouldn't have. So they can have 10 times more kinetic energy than a supernova. So on the left hand side here, you might have a typical supernova. And what's occurring there is that you have some ejected material. <clears throat> so during the supernova, those outer layers of the star are then blown away and you get this expanding shell. That's your ejected material. That's a fairly typical supernova. But with a hypernova, you actually get additional powerful jets. So you get these two jets at the poles, essentially the rotation axis. And they will penetrate that supernova ejector. And this is the thing that stands out from a hypernova to a supernova is these powerful jets that we typically wouldn't see with a normal supernova. Now, during a supernova, 
some of that ejected material might fall back onto the star. If that falls back onto the star, it can obviously help the star, or the, it's not necessarily a star at that point anymore, it'll be a neutron star or a black hole, it will help it to grow a bit more. So that will grow a bit more as the material falls onto it. But if that star is fast rotating, you get an accretion disk forming. So this is a disk of material that's rotating around the object. It'll be in the same plane as the rotation of the actual central object. So it could be a neutron star or a black hole. So you have this accretion disk with the inner part falling onto the neutron star or black hole. So it in spirals in, and over time, it will be fairly short lived. It will all be depleted and fall onto the central object, but it basically in spirals in in this disk. Now, as that happens, you end up with relativistic jets being produced perpendicular to the rotation axis. So this is actually what causes the hypernova, really, is this accretion disk, which then powers these powerful perpendicular jets, which are relativistic, which means that they are the emitted jets are traveling at a relativistic velocity, which is close to the speed of light. So almost at a maximum velocity that they can be. And those powerful jets will accelerate particles to about 99% of the speed of light. And that's where your very high kinetic energy comes from with a hypernova in comparison to a supernova. And they will penetrate through that ejector, basically so that ejector material, they will penetrate that. And then we can actually observe these powerful jets. You can actually get intermediate in between the two where you may have some weak jets forming that don't necessarily penetrate through that shell of material around which has been emitted. Now, they're not fully understood as to why they're produced, but some ideas really that they could be the collapse of a fast rotating massive star. So let's say type two supernova, they form from the core collapse of a massive star. If you have a extremely fast rotating star, then you can get that accretion disk and then the powerful jets forming. So that's one possible solution. It, they could also be parts of binary systems, which could then actually help in the production of these jets as well. But again, they're not fully understood and there might be multiple mechanisms that actually produce these. But thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed, then do check out some of the other videos.